This chapter describes how Indra, the king of heaven, was victorious over the soldiers of the demons. And it also describes the shield of the Vishnu mantras. To take protection from this shield, one must first touch Kushagras and wash one's mouth with Achman mantras. One should observe silence and then place the eight syllable Vishnu mantra on the parts of his body and place the 12 syllable mantras on his head. The eight syllable mantra is Om Namo Narayanaya. This mantra should be distributed all over the front and back of the body. The 12 syllable mantra, which begins with the pranava Omkar, is Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. One syllable should be placed on each of the fingers and should be preceded by the pranava Omkar. Thereafter, one must chant Om Vishnave Namaha, which is a six syllable mantra. One syllable should be placed on each of the fingers and should be preceded by the pranava omkar. Thereafter, one must chant Om Vishnave Namaha, which is a six syllable mantra. One must progressively place the syllables of the mantra on the heart, the head, between the two eyebrows, on the shikha, and between the eyes. And then one should chant Mad Maha Maha Ashra Astraya Fat. And with this mantra, protect himself from all directions. Na Devo Devam Archayet. One who has not risen to the level of a deva cannot chant this mantra. According to this direction of the Shastra, one must think himself qualitatively non-different from the Supreme. After finishing this dedication, one must offer a prayer to the right arm Lord Vishnu, who sits on the shoulder of Garuda Dev. One also has to think of the fish incarnation, Vaman, Kurna, Narsimha, Varaha, Parashuram, Ramachandra, and the elder brother of Lakshman, Narnarayan, Dattatreya, an empowered incarnation, Kapila, Dhanmantre, Rishabdev, Yajna, Balaram, Vyasadev, Buddha Dev, and Keshava. One should think of Govinda, the master of Vrindavan. And one should think of Narayan, the master of the spiritual sky. One should think of Madhusudan, Tridham, Madhava, Rishikesha, Padmanabha, Janardana, Damodara, and Vishweshwara. As well as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna himself. After offering prayers to the Lord's personal expansions, Known as the Swamsha and Shaktyavesh avatars, one should pray to the weapon of Lord Narayan, such as the Sudarshan, Gada, Shankha, Khadga, and Po. After explaining this process, Shukdev Goswami told Maharaj Parishit how Vishwarup, the brother of Ritrasur, described the glories of the Narayan Kavach to Indra. You want to go to the words? Yes. Six, eight, nine. You're able to send it? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Dvaipayano Bhagavan. Okay. So, do we recite the words, please? Yeah. Okay. okay. Dvaipayano Bhagavan Aprabodhad. Dvaipayano Bhagavan Aprabodhad. tu Pashanda Guna Pramadat. Kalki Kale Kal. Kal, kalki Kale Kal Malat Prapatu Dharma Vanayoru Kruta Vataraha Dvaipayano Bhagavan Aprabodha Uddhas to Pashanda Gana Pramadat Kalki Kale Kala Malat Pramatu Dharma Vanayo Rukrta Vataraha 
भगवान अप्रबोधाषंडगण प्रमादा कल की कले काल मला प्रभा धर्मावनायोर्कृतावतार ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಣ of atheists creating disillusionment for innocent persons pramadat from the madness ki lord kalki carnation of kesha kale of this kalyuga kal malat which is of age of prapatu may he protect maavnar you know, for the protection of religious principles guru very great tavatar who to can incarnation please translation for also like that okay it's creative <laughs> creative and efficient okay translation purported by his divine grace isi bhakti vedant swami shri prabhupad may the personality of godhead in his incarnation as yasde protect me from all kinds of ignorance resulting from the absence of vedic knowledge may lord buddha dev protect me from activities opposed to vedic principles and from laziness that causes one to madly forget the vedic principles of knowledge and ritualistic action may kalki dev the supreme personality of godhead who appeared as an incarnation to protect religious principles protect me from the dirt of the age of kali purport like someone like you This verse mentions various incarnations of the supreme personality of Godhead who appear for various purposes. Sri La Vyasadev Mahamuni compiled the Vedic literature for the benefit of all human society. If one wants to be protected from the reactions of ignorance even in this age of Kali, one may consult the books left by Sri La Vyasadev, namely the four Vedas, Sama, Yajur, Rig and Atharva. the one uh, the 108 upanishads vedanta sutra brahma sutra mahabharat shrimad bhagavatam mahapurana vyasadev's commentary on the brahma sutra and the other 17 puranas only by the mercy of shrila vyasadev do we have so many volumes of transcendental knowledge to save us from the clutches of ignorance as described by shrila jayadev goswami in his dashavatar stotra Lord Buddha apparently decreed decreed the Vedic knowledge nindasi yagya vidher aha shruti jatratam sadaya hridaya darshita pashu ghatam keshava trita buddha sharira jaya jagadish hare the mission of lord buddha was to save people from the abominable activity of animal killing and to save the poor animals from being unnecessarily killed when pashandis were cheating by killing animals on the plea of sacrificing them in vedic yagyas the lord said 
If the Vedic injunctions allow animal killing, I do not accept the Vedic principles. Thus, he actually saved people who acted according to Vedic principles. One should therefore surrender to Lord Buddha so that he can help one avoid misusing the injunctions of the Vedas. The Kalki avatar is the fierce incarnation who vanquishes the class of the atheists born in this age of Kali. Now, in the beginning of Kali Yoga, many irreligious principles are in effect. And as Kali Yoga advances, many pseudo-religious principles will certainly be introduced. And people will forget the real religious principles enunciated by Lord Krishna before the beginning of Kali Yoga, namely principles of surrender unto the lotus feet of the Lord. Unfortunately, because of Kali Yoga, foolish people do not surrender to the lotus feet of Krishna. Even most people who claim to belong to the Vedic system of religion are actually opposed to the Vedic principles. Every day the, they manufacture a new type of dharma on the plea that whatever one manufactures is also a path of liberation. Atheistic men generally say, yata mata tatha patha. According to this view, there are hundreds and thousands of different opinions in human society, and each opinion is a valid religious principle. This philosophy of rascals has killed the religious principles mentioned in the Vedas, and such philosophies will become increasingly influential as Kali Yoga progresses. In the last stage of Kali Yoga, Kalki Deva, the fierce incarnation of Keshava, will descend to kill all the atheists and will save only the devotees of the Lord. Om Gyan Timiran Hasya Gyanan Jilishalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Ascha Tedesha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Vescha Trapasindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanepro Vishna Vibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Srivasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Grateful to be here with all of you and today we are discussing the chapter in the Srimad Bhagavatam where its distinctive dramatic style or narrative style is evident. The Bhagavatam in some ways reflects the typical literature that were composed at its time, but in some ways it is significantly different. The Bhagavatam is part of the Puranas and the Puranas are filled with stories. However, the Bhagavatam has lots of stories However, in the middle of the stories, sometimes it pauses for elaborate prayers. And the idea is the Bhagavatam is not just narrating a story. The purpose of the Bhagavatam is to emphasize and elevate consciousness. And say, for example, sometimes if there is an action movie, you know, somebody is doing a lot of brilliant action stunts. Now, now what happens? Now that person may do those action stunts so fast that neither the opponent nor the spectators understood what happened. That five opponents standing nearby and all of them five knocked down. <laughs> so what happened? So what happens So sometimes to show that when the action is about to happen, the movie goes into slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> and they are showing, okay, this is what, this is. they move the hand like this, move the leg like this, dodge like this, like that, and then, oh, this is what happened. And you can appreciate it more. So the idea is what is more important is emphasized. And one way of emphasizing is taking slow motion. So similarly in the Bhagavatam, 
the emphasis is not so much on the narration on the action it is there and it's important part of the bhagavatam but the emphasis on the consciousness and that's why that that is sort of expanded so something similar to showing in slow motion so a brahmastra is coming a deadly weapon is coming toward arjuna and arjuna is turning toward krishna and offering prayers so how does he offer prayers you may say the weapon is coming how can you offer prayers but that is reflecting the consciousness now if somebody is very prayerful spontaneously prayers come up from that person so just like somebody who doesn't have a habit somebody has a habit as soon as they slip or fall we say krishna that just become a habit they don't have to think about it if somebody is deeply immersed in krishna consciousness the prayers may come spontaneously but the bhagavatam emphasizes those prayers in fact it seems out of the 300 and uh, 300 plus chapters that are there in the bhagavatam more than 20% of the chapters or 20% of the content of the bhagavatam is prayers mm-hmm. elaborate prayers so the different prayers serve different purposes and this is one of the you could say unusual prayers in the bhagavatam most prayers are are either glorifying the lord or seeking his protection at least in the bhagavatam there are different kinds of prayers but here specifically the past time of rutrasura is going on where he is a fierce demon who is uh, who has a fascinating back story which will be revealed later but he has just not just defeat he has not just defeated the devatas but he has effortlessly defeated the devatas mm-hmm. so that is something which the devatas can't digest it's one thing say if there's a world tennis number one player and some unknown upstart who is not even seeded who came in by by to the qualifying rounds <laughs> and then there's upset that person defeats that world number one that's bad enough but if that player does a bagel and defeats 60 60 that's totally humiliating so something like that happened this unknown demon rutrasura comes and just destroys the devatas and the devatas don't know what to do and one definition of intelligence is to know what to do when you don't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> what it means is that we turn to god for guidance i don't know what to do i pray to the lord so that is intelligence to know what to do when we don't know what to do so if you're driving we don't know where to drive the intelligent thing is to uh, turn towards some expert who can guide us so here the devatas they turn toward the supreme lord and they offer prayers and this is they are seeking protection from the devatas mm-hmm. so from the supreme lord rather and this particular set of prayers is called the narayana kavacha so kavacha means uh, armor or a shield and narayana of course is the name of the supreme lord so these are the prayers by which uh, a subtle shield is formed it's not a physical shield that is worn it is a mantra shield that is subtle that is applied around the body through subtle means by which a person is protected no this idea of the subtle domain or the non physical domain uh, science may be skeptical of it but almost all science fiction has it Yeah. isn't it <laughs> so even in movies you know there is one one five person attacking the other person and their blows are seem to be landing what happened if hitting 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 that person has some invisible defense mechanism around it or something like that mm-hmm. so you can't see it but it is there and so like the, this is the idea the subtle domain so what happens is we may have reductionistic science which says no everything has to be quantified measured well it has to be physical and tangible and measurable that's okay we may that may be the approach of science and it is valid as far as it goes but actually attraction to the supernatural is natural for the human heart yeah. <laughs> attraction to the supernatural is natural and that's why all sto- most stories most science fiction most uh, most superheroes they all have some supernatural abilities and people suspend their rationality and they enjoy it 
So that's because ultimately the heart is attracted to the supreme supernatural being, that is Krishna. So this is a subtle shield that is formed using the mantras. And this is being used by Indra to protect himself from Narayan. And within that set of prayers, there's one prayer which describes how the various avatars who appear, the various descents of the Lord who appear at various times, they are being invoked for protection. And the protection sort is corresponding to their particular mission. So now sometimes we differentiate between the material and the spiritual. When we say that we should not pray to the Lord for material things. We should pray to the Lord for spiritual things. So that is the theme I'll focus on. Even Krishna appears to the world. Does he come to provide material protection or spiritual protection? What do you think? Yeah. Well, there are only three answers. You give all three. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, if we consider, if we consider Krishna's mission in the Bhagavad Gita, 4 7, 4 7 describes that he descends. And 4 8 describes what is the purpose. Paritranaya sadhana, vinashaya chadushkrita, dharma samsthapana arthaya, sambhavami yuge yuge. So, 4 8 describes the mission is dharma. And 4, 9 and 10, so 4, 7 and 4, 8 describe the mission of Dharma. 4, 9 and 4, 10 describe another part of it. Janma karma chame divyam evam yo vitti tatvataha jaktva deham punar janma naiti mame tiso arjuna and then vitaraga bhaya krodha manmaya mamu pashritaha bahavo jnana tapasa puta madbhav magataha So we could say broadly Krishna is describing two missions in this set of two two verses. One is a mission in the world. Mm. And the second is the mission in the heart. Mm. So the mission in the world is to establish dharma. And that means those who are lawbreakers. Dharma here means social order. To establish order in society. And those who are lawbreakers, those who are disruptors, those who are uh, despots, Krishna neutralizes them. And in one sense, you can say dharma is material. Material in the sense that I'll talk about how the words material and spiritual need to be nuanced. But material in the sense that external order in society. So Kamsa is terrorizing. Kamsa is killing Vasudeva and Devaki's children in cold blood. And then Krishna descends. And Krishna kills Kamsa. So the idea is that material order that is conducive for spiritual growth, that is dharma. So Krishna comes to establish dharma in the world. And that is his immediate action. But the problem is that by the power of time, everything declines. So that mission is temp that mission of the eternal Lord also has a temporary effect. The order is established, but soon from order comes disorder. However, the enduring legacy of the Lord is not the external mission, but the internal mission. He performs various pastimes and those who become attracted to those pastimes, they fall in love with him. And for them, spiritual growth happens. They develop bhava, they develop prema. So we could say there's twofold mission to establish dharma in the world and to inspire prema in the heart. Mm -hmm. So both these missions are there. And sometimes as devotees say that, you know, we are not interested in politics. Now, we may say we are not interested in politics, but politics is interested in us. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, politics affects everyone. If there's one political change in the government. The government can change policies. In India, in one of the states, a very, uh, very pious state in India, uh, where the government changed, and the day the government changed, the next day, they legalized cow slaughter. So, there is now, cow slaughter in India is still quite strongly reproached. So there are changes that happen. So politics will affect us. Mm -hmm. And in one sense, political uh, changes are, uh, are something which can either direct resources for spiritually or can misdirect resources for mundane and sensual purposes. We could say at one level, Krishna doesn't say, I'm not interested in politics. Krishna's whole purpose is to bring about political change. Isn't it? Duryodhana is the ruler. And the Kauravas are the ruler and Krishna wants the Pandavas to be rulers. 
So we, we can't dismiss the mundane as simply mundane. So there is a big difference between, even if we say the political rulers are not spiritual, but even if they, whether they are in goodness, whether they're in passion or they're in ignorance, that can make a huge difference. Those who are in passion, at least they will take care of the world and the administration enough so that people's material life can go on smoothly. But those who are in ignorance, they will simply exploit and destroy. So that is dangerous. So Krishna does is concerned about the external world also. And in that sense, the material is not insignificant for Krishna, the material dimension of life. So that is the theme I'll focus on today. We start the point that when Krishna descends, he has this material and spiritual dimension both to it. So you can make it full screen. So, so we'll, when see, seeking material protection or material help from God is spiritually unhealthy and when it isn't. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So now we may say, I want to practice pure devotion. I want to, I want to develop love for God. So most people are the opposite. Most people, what is the idea? They're seeking material things from God. So for them, in one sense, religion is like a cheaper alternative to shopping. <laughs> so a prayer is basically yeah. like a shopping list. <laughs> so you pray to God, I want this, I want, please give me this, please give me this, please give me this. So now what is the problem with this? If you are seeking only material things, go ahead. So first of all, it is based on an inadequate understanding of God. We see God as the fulfiller of our desires. And he can be a fulfiller of our desires, but actually he is the fulfillment of our desires. He is the supreme, all attractive being. And only by attaining him will we attain contentment, will we attain fulfillment. Otherwise, no matter how many things we attain, the result is that we just, see, what happens that everything we crave doesn't, we crave for an object. And you think if I get that object, I'll become happy. But what happens? The very act of craving strengthens the tendency for craving. And then even if you get that object, the craving tendency is still there. And we'll crave for something else. So if we are habituated to looking at the things that we don't have, even if we get those things, so imagine this is a category of things I have, this is a category of things I don't have. Hmm? If my habit is to look at the things that I don't have, even if I move 1, 10, 50, 100 things from that category to this category, the things I don't have, the things I have. But the problem is not what I have and what I don't have. The problem is what is my habitual tendency? Mm -hmm. So every time we are staring and craving for the things we don't have, we are strengthening that tendency. And the result of that will be, there will always be things which we don't have. Isn't it? Nobody can possess everything in the world. Mm -hmm. So then we will always stay dissatisfied. So the problem is not what we, uh, the problem is not what we possess or we don't possess. The problem is what we crave for. Mm -hmm. People want to improve the standard of living and that's fine. Nobody wants to live in poverty or anxiety resulting from that. But more important than improving our standard of living is improving our standard of longing standard of longing. What is the quality of my desires? So am I simply craving for the things that I don't have? And that's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Is there something higher that I can seek? So that is, so this is the problem. It is based on inadequate understanding of God. And we see him as the fulfiller of desires, but no matter how many desires are fulfilled, more will still remain. And then, yeah, you can go ahead. It's also a utilitarian reciprocations. You know, what happens is we are going to God but we are not interested in who he is. We are interested in what he can give us. In India, especially, there are many temples. There are temples of God, there are temples of demigods, and there are temples of semi-gods. <laughs> now, what is semi-god? Say me God. <laughs> I am God. <laughs> so many times people just go to the temple and they close their eyes and they pray fervently. And then after that, you wonder who is there on the altar? <laughs> For them, there's hardly any interest in who is on the altar. 
whether that as long as that person fulfills my desires that's the idea so there is very little interest in god per se and this is a very so this doesn't lead to a any kind of uh, both the understanding is improper and the relationship is also very utilitarian you know suppose somebody is normally very gruff and rude or curt with us and one day they come i start talking very politely and sweetly immediately the mind gets a question what does this person want from me <laughs> so when somebody is sweet with it only when they want something then that's not a very pleasing relationship so we can apply the same dynamic to god that seeking only material relation so this is the problem with it you go ahead but that doesn't mean approaching god for material things itself is bad there's something right about it also and what is it that is right that at least there is a relationship suppose there is a parent from whom the child has got estranged for a long estranged for a long time and then after a long time after several years of estrangement the child calls the parents and now what would be the parents prominent question the child wants the child is in trouble and wants some help so will the parent say that you know after all this time you just call me just to ask for this or will the parents ask what took you so long to call me what took you so long to come to me so in that sense which krishna is happy when we connect with him that's why krishna also says sukriti na ha chaturvidha bhajante mam jana sukrutino arjuna he says whatever reason somebody comes to me krishna says they are good souls they are good souls of course this is 716 and 719 he says those who those who come to krishna for the fulfillment of their desires the so see him as the fulfiller of so see them as the fulfiller of their desires even he calls them as good souls but those who see him as the fulfiller of their desires bahunam janmanamante gyanaman mam prapadyate vasudevah sarvamiti samahatma sudurlava then he calls as mahatmas so mahatmas are great souls so krishna wants all of us to become great souls but even if we become good souls come to us he's happy about it so approaching god for material things is itself not a bad thing here we see indra he is approaching vishnu for protection oh this demon i can't fight with him and that is just this prayers are described in the bhagavata why because that is also a good thing a coming to god for it so sometimes we can say the good is the enemy of the best that is true but the good is definitely better than the bad so it depends on where the person is that we have to uh, we have to decide how how to guide or elevate a person or even elevate ourselves suppose a parent parent has parents have two children and one of them just barely scrapes through the exams getting about 40% marks and the other is brilliant they get 100% marks out and today and uh, one day both of them come with the results and both of them have got 70% and the first child steps forward the father says well done and pats him on the back and the second child says forward and pounds him on the back what have you done so hey, hey, both of god both of got the same marks why this discrimination well it's not discrimination it's a reciprocation based on the level for a person who is at 40% level 70% is a step up and that's why well done for a person who is 100% 70% is a step down that's why what have you done okay so similarly for those who never turn towards god mm-hmm. for them if they turn towards god whatever be the reason mm-hmm. i mean india once i saw a lecture by one one indian guru he says why not try god yeah. <laughs> you know you try this you try that try that either. why not try god that's fair enough let's try it out so that is a good soul somebody who turns towards god for that but somebody who is at the level where they can they are at 100% level they are they are potential they are seeking pure devotion or they have pure devotion for them to come down to utilitarian level that is not good that's why what have you done so we have to understand the level so what's right with it is that if somebody at 40% moving towards 70% is good 
Yeah, go ahead. Now we may say, oh, we are all at hundred percent. You know, we are all pure devotees. Mm -hmm. Well, to think we are pure devotees is generally pure illusion. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, we can say that we are aspiring for pure devotion, but even that is that may not be our most prominent aspiration. You know, we all have something in Krishna Bhakti that in Krishna consciousness that we enjoy more than Krishna. <laughs> it's Krishna consciousness, but we enjoy something more than Krishna. It may be prasad. <laughs> it may be prasad. It may be music. It may be maybe just exhibiting our abilities. It may be leadership. It may be management. Whatever it is, we enjoy that, and that's and Krishna accepts that. That is not the higher taste. But that is within the domain of higher taste. <laughs> so, if we seek only spiritual things, you see that's good. But that's good ultimately. But it may not be good contextually. Let's see what's the problem with it. Yeah. So, see, material things occupy a prominent place in our heart, whether we admit it or not. They occupy a prominent place. And if we say, "I will not pray for anything material to Krishna." Then what happens is a large part of our heart stays unconnected with Krishna, mm. and then the result of that is what? Go ahead. And when we may pray to Krishna, that may be a ritual, but because the things we are praying for are not really that important for us right now, mm. so we can't invest much emotion in our relationship, in our in our prayer to Krishna, in our relationship with Krishna. So if somebody is very sick and the thing is working for them and they just, that's, their health is disrupting all aspects of their life and they say, Krishna, please help me to chant purely. Well, it's good that we're praying like that. But that it's difficult for that to be the most prominent concern in the person's mind when there is a much more urgent existential concern. Isn't it? So, that, so if we say, I'll not pray for anything material. That's okay. Another problem, that's okay in principle. But in practice, it may not work. It may, not, it may prevent our heart from getting connected with Krishna. And material is also a very big word. Because what does material mean? In material, there is goodness, there is passion, and there is ignorance. So, if somebody is praying that, yeah, what is, you know, that, how there are people who are intolerant, Say so that there are three people from three intolerant religions went to God. And the first person from religion A said, Oh God, I don't want anything for myself. I just want the world to be rid of this terrible religion B and all its followers. Mm -hmm. And the person from religion B goes, Oh God, I don't want anything for myself. I just want the world to be rid of this religion A and all its followers. Mm -hmm. And the person from religion C goes and says, Oh God, I don't want anything from myself. I just want you to fulfill the prayers of religion A and religion B. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, these are like Thomasic prayers, wanting the destruction of other people. That's one thing. But so we could say that is material. But if somebody has a newborn baby, and that baby is in an ICU and is sick and I don't know whether she will live or die. And should we tell the parents, don't pray to Krishna. That is material. Mm -hmm. You know, well, okay. There's a big difference between material and tamasic and parents who love their child, who want to responsibly raise their child. And their, their child is dying. So, if we, if we do not understand that there are various things within the material, now, you, how can parents whose child is near death think of anything else? They'll pray to Krishna, they'll chant intensely. I know one a couple of couple in New Zealand, their child was born like almost three months earlier. And they said that they did every day that he was in the uh, incubator. So, he said, we didn't know whether she would live or die. They're telling that those three months were the best three months when we chanted in our life. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, okay, they're, they're praying to Krishna for their child's safety, but still they were praying. They're praying to Krishna and they, their connection with that baby 
inspire them to connect better with Krishna. So we cannot just artificially partition material and spiritual. Like even for Krishna, he establishes dharma so that prema can be established. Isn't it? So the material can be a foundation for the spiritual. We may say it is not essential. Well, it may not be essential for some people who are exalted pure devotees. But for most people, the material is the foundation for the spiritual. Isn't it? Now, all of you are attending this class. If there were no guarantee whether Prasadam would be there after the class or not. <laughs> but the focus of the class would be much less. <laughs> so, for most of us, the material is a foundation for the spiritual. Let me go ahead. Let finish a couple of slides. So, now we may say, but our scriptures say, aspire for pure devotional service. So, what do we do? How can we ask only for the spiritual? So, in two things. First is, we need to hear properly so that we understand the enduring value of the spiritual. Because in the material world with our senses, primarily our eyes, we'll see worldly things and we'll think these are what are attractive, these are what are valuable, these are what are indispensable in fact. So, so we need to hear regularly. The eyes are frequently the way to illusion and the ears are the way to illumination. So we need to hear regularly. Then we will remember the value of the spiritual. But along with that, it's not just here. We understand properly so that we expand our understanding of the spiritual. So what is spiritual? So we could, actually everything is potentially spiritual. So things can have different definitions depend on different contexts. So, if, so if for example, if you consider the word spiritual, before I go into the spiritual, consider say, in English, there's the word run or running. Run is said to have the maximum meanings among all the words. There are 640 meanings of run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I go, I'm running in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, my washing machine is not running. Mm -hmm. Who is running for president now? <laughs> I am running because my car is not running. <laughs> <laughs> so, so words can have different meanings. And not, we look at context and we understand the meaning. So the word spiritual can have two different meanings. One is by composition. So the body is spiritual, sorry, the soul is spiritual, the body is material. So by composition means that which is made of Sat Chit Ananda. And in that sense, the body is material and the soul is spiritual. There's a radical differentiation. But then the same Bhagavad in the second chapter, which talks about his radical differentiation, has that well, that, that verse 424. Brahmarpanam Brahmavir Brahmagno Brahmanautam Brahmayutena Gantavyam Brahma Karma Samadina. There is so much Brahma that we don't know what is Brahma. <laughs> but what Krishna is saying over is thereby essentially by application. Everything that can be used for a spiritual purpose, everything that can be used in Krishna's service, that is spiritual. So, uh, so for example, if somebody is uh, thinking, is, is concerned for my health, material or spiritual. Well, what are we seeking health for? If the purpose of our life is spiritual, if I want to be healthy, so that I can serve Krishna, so that I can develop love for Krishna, so I can help others develop love for Krishna, then concern for the health can also be spiritualized. Mm -hmm. If somebody is worried about a job, if somebody is very anxious about having a good relationship, now is that material or is that spiritual? Well, it's not so black and white. What is the purpose? Does one want a job or a relationship so just one can gratify one's senses or one can have a st stable foundation by which one can pursue spiritual life more vigorously. So rather than simply thinking that we should, uh, we should, we should never pray to Krishna for anything material. It's difficult. The material things are important for us. What we can do is rather than changing the things that we value, we can't do that immediately. Rather than changing the things that we value, we can pray to change the reason we value those things. Mm -hmm. Rather than changing the things we value, health, wealth, relationships, career, we change the reason we value those things. So Krishna, I, I want my health to improve. Krishna, I hope that this, I pray that this job works out so that I can serve you better. 
So we focus not so much on differentiating between matter, matter and spirit as differentiating between or, or changing, transforming our intention behind it. We go ahead. Last slide. Okay, so this is a like a this pendulum is a summary of everything that we discussed. If we seek only, we pray for Krishna only for material spiritual growth, even while material things are important for us. And what will happen is our relationship with Krishna will stay very superficial because the major part of our heart is disconnected from Krishna. On the other hand, if we seek only for material things without caring for Krishna, then it's like utilitarian. Again, the relationship will be superficial. Mm. But if we connect with the Lord for the things that matter to us and for the things that we want to matter to us, mm. they don't matter right now so much to me, but I want them to matter. So if we do that, then we will have a deep relationship. Go ahead. A deep relationship and a deepening relationship. The relationship will keep getting stronger and stronger. Through every prayer, through every act of devotion, every devotional service will become stronger and stronger in our relationship with Krishna. We go ahead. Last slide. So, so the concluding reflection is that we cannot become pure devotees without first becoming devotees. <laughs> we cannot become pure. What does that mean practically? Yeah. You know, we aspire to develop a pure relationship with Krishna. At the same time, we act to develop a real relationship with Krishna. A real means if you have a real friend, we don't partition our life. Okay, with my friend, I'll only talk about these things. Now we talk about all the things that are important for us, whatever things are weighing our heart, are burdening our mind, we talk about. So similarly, we try to develop a real relationship with Krishna. And our focus should be more on connecting our heart with Krishna than purifying our heart. Because if our heart becomes connected with Krishna, Krishna's very presence will eventually lead to purification. So I'll summarize. I broadly discussed four points today. First, I talked about the Bhagavatam's emphasis on prayers. How, because the Bhagavatam is focusing on consciousness, so there is slow motion almost to emphasize the prayers. And these they talk then about the is, these prayers are for material protection of Indra. So are they appropriate in the Bhagavatam? So we discussed how the Lord descends for both material and spiritual purposes, to establish material dharma in the world, material order, so that spiritual prema can be established in the heart. And then discussed about what's right and what's what's wrong, what's wrong and what's right about approaching the Lord for material things. Wrong because it's a very utilitarian relationship based on you know, inadequate understanding of God. It's right is at least we're relating like a long lost child coming back to the parents. And then what's wrong and right about approaching the Lord for spiritual things? Well, wrong is that we will major part of our heart will stay disconnected uh, because what matters to us, we are not connecting with him. And even if we pray, you're not really praying about the thing that matter usually to us. So then what, what's the right? How can we make this right? By first hearing regularly so that we start valuing the spiritual and also understanding properly so that we expand our understanding of the spiritual. It's not just by composition that something becomes spiritual, but also by application. So rather than saying that we won't pray for material things to the Lord, we can, we can, we can change why we pray for material things. Mm -hmm. Not for our gratification, but for better, better use in his service. For a better situation to serve him. And that way, rather than focusing on not connecting, uh, on purifying a heart, we can focus on connecting the heart and purification will result. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Do we have some time for questions? Yes, please. any questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank, you for the uh, thank you for the class, Prabhu. Uh, I have, like, I guess, a practical question about something that you said towards the beginning of class about how uh, you know, devotees don't care so much about politics, but politics cares about us, so we can't totally ignore it. Mm. Uh, I was just wondering what should a devotee's approach be towards voting, especially considering that the caliber of politician isn't, you can partly find one in the mode of passion, let alone the mode of goodness. Uh, so what should a devotee's approach towards voting be? See, in general, this is something individual. So that is something which... Uh, you could say the overall understanding as our movement is also going into the next generations, it is not so much what is our the Krishna conscious movement supposed to do. It's not the, some understanding is meant to instruct. 
instruct oversee discipline you know that's the idea as you know you should vote for this party if you don't vote you will be punished <laughs> it's not like that it's not instructing overseeing and disciplining it is more of training and trusting we train okay this is what we want to pursue in our life and now how do you pursue it it's individual conscience individual responsibility that's that's the purpose of krishna conscience and the prabhupada wanted all of us to be independently thoughtful so basically my understanding it's very dismissive to consider that oh all politicians are more the passion and ignorance so why bother about politics as i said that even passion and ignorance there is a big difference mm-hmm. and bhakti not thakur says that sometimes rajas passion can be a can be a temporary but necessary antidote to the toxicity of tamas so you know they say if pa- the parents are very passionate that means eh, parents have a lot of demand on the children you should get this many marks you should do this you should do this and the children may find it's overbearing but that's far better than say parents who are in tamas they are say that their parents are doing drugs and they don't care even the children exist or not children have to fend for food so there's a big difference between rajas and tamas so each of us needs to think ourselves in our particular situation and there is a hierarchy of values uh, and yes we can say that all the parents may eat me they may many of them but say consider there are some issues where they may be favorable so uh, we have to look at uh, things in terms of hierarchy of values many of the top values which we value they may not care for them at all but there are other values say for example what is somebody stand on abortion that is something is important what is, is is somebody supporting vegan culture or they just interested in just promoting a meat and things like that you know are they supportive of eastern spirituality or are they hostile towards it seeing it as a threat to their own their own ethnic culture or whatever so there are various ways in which the concerns of the mainstream politics polit- political discourse will affect us and we have to based on that Uh, decide which concerns are most important and make a reasonable choice now of course some devotees may feel that i'm just not interested and i have not vote that's also okay so that can be an individual preference but collective apathy as a policy for every all devotees that is not a healthy thing okay thank you yes thank you uh ru had a comment so uh, uh i was just thinking that the exclusive uh benefit of approaching krishna or vishnu especially with material desires as we can see from so many stories is that krishna purifies the heart also uh when we are approaching him so gradually there is purification and the the root of desire is purified with time so yes. yes that is true if you see akama sarva kama va moksha kama udar this is whether you have desires or no desires just approach the lord and that will lead to purification that is true of course you will see the duration varies we've considered three stories in the bhagavatam uh, let's take two now quickly with dhruva as soon as he saw the lord he became purified he gave up the desire for a kingdom on the other hand if you see pururava pururava was infatuated with urvashi and she left him he actually performed the yagya to gain vishnu uh, to please vishnu and vishnu appeared in yagya and vishnu was in front of him but what happened is he said please i want urvashi so and he got urvashi but the result was that eventually he became disillusioned so so uh, what it means is that purification will happen by contact with the lord but how long that purification will take that depends on how strongly a person is attached so we get a glimpse of the higher taste and we have the lower taste now we may say higher and lower but that's more of a objective analysis for the person at that time that lower taste may seem far higher isn't it so but at least the higher taste has penetrated into consciousness and sooner or later that person will turn so that's how it works okay thank you yes higher taste and a, uh and a lower taste is it like um I just had a thought that it had something to do with um 
renouncing things that are uh, favorable and things that are unfavorable. What do you think? Okay. Is the higher taste note is related with renouncing things that are unfavorable or accepting things that are, things that are favorable? Like the lower taste would be like, um, you know, material um, situations or things that, that are actually favorable to your material life, but renouncing them. Okay. That's a good question. Sorry. So now I got it clearly. See, basically, that's why I don't very much, I feel the word material and spiritual, especially when material is contrasted with the spiritual, is not particularly helpful. Say, if you're in America, people say that, are you from Asia? Well, Asia is so big. <laughs> <laughs> in Asia, there is China, and there is Philippines, and there is India, and there is, there is the Middle East. Well, and each of these have different, uh, different cultures, different, so it's a difference. Even India is so big. North India and South India are hugely different. <laughs> Sometimes in India, if the, a marriage between an Indian American is easier than a marriage between North Indian and South India. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it, these are two huge categories to be very helpful. Yeah, so similarly, I feel material is too huge a category. Because in material, there is goodness, passion, and ignorance. And broadly speaking, we can say that passion is anti-devotional. Sorry, ignorance is anti-devotional. Passion is non-devotional. And goodness is pro-devotional. So we need to discern within the material. Within the material and see. Can I say, what, what, is, what is it that... So if something is pro-devotional, and I reject that as mundane, that is what is called as falgo vairagya. That is called as false renunciation. Mm. So that we need to, uh, that renunciation would be counterproductive for our spiritual growth. On the other hand, if we equate what is in goodness and what is in ignorance, mm. and say that, oh, it's all mundane. Then, uh, our, our, it's, no, we say that, oh, it's, you know, I can use what is in ignorance also in devotional service. Well, potentially it's possible, but practically it's very difficult. If somebody has a habit of uh, uh, reading a lot of books and understanding, uh, getting a lot of information, getting a lot of knowledge, not necessarily spiritual, but material knowledge, that can be used. That is, that is good, broadly, you can say it's goodness. It's not just reading, uh, breaking news and updates, but really analysis and understanding. That is, that is useful. For serve, that is useful. You can use that knowledge later to serve Krishna, to present Krishna consciousness from a broader perspective. But somebody, so that is in, that is material, but it can be in goodness. But if somebody has say, a habit of just uh, consuming content indiscriminately, same thing. If he is surfing one side, another side, another side, another side. You know, or earlier the TV channels is changing channels. Uh, the searches have found that people are more attentive when they are changing channels than when they are watching channels. <laughs> <laughs> because once you start watching, I know what is going to go on. It's boring. Changing something new, something good will come. <laughs> so that side of in that's like you know, it's it's just so trying to escape from reality without connecting with anything. That is tamasic. So that that needs to be given up. So I would say that we have to understand, we have to ask ourselves, look, is this pro-devotional, non-devotional, anti-devotional for me? And based on that, we decide what I need to keep a distance from and what I can continue to connect with. Okay. Yes, I was wondering, how do we make sure we don't just be stuck in asking for material things for Krishna? Because I mean, you express how yeah, our heart has so many material things, and it's good actually to mm -hmm. pray to Krishna for it. It's true. But I was just wondering, because sometimes then, yeah. can we keep doing it forever, I guess? That's my question. That's a good question. Can we keep asking Krishna for material things forever? Or oh, how will we outgrow that? So that's where our sadhana and our practice of bhakti comes in. See, as I said, the lower taste does not appear lower to the person who is in lower consciousness. Somebody is an alcoholic, you know, when that urge for alcohol hits them, they may know intellectually, if I drink, no, this can disrupt my, I may lose my job, I may lose my family, I may lose my health, so many things. But at that time, that's what seems to, what I need, I can't live without it. So that is very difficult to artificially change. But what if, if we are practicing bhakti, both intellectually and experientially, 
bhakti changes our values intellectually hearing the philosophy helps us really understand what is truly valuable and what is readily less valuable and that like intellectual understanding is the, is the foundation it is not the conclusion but after that we also start gaining experience yeah i thought that you know i can't live without drinking tea or this or that and, but then i we immerse ourselves in kirtan we have some katha we do some seva we feel such fulfillment somebody says you know i can't skip even one meal and then there is some festival and we fast all day and we are we are blissful okay hey, what happened <laughs> so maybe what i think i need is not what i really need so if we also get experience so both both on intelligence and experience bhakti changes our values mm. so once we do that automatically even if we ask for material things we will not ask with that much a uh, fervor there not with that much agitation won't be there if we get it or don't get it so so artificially trying to stop it may again disconnect the heart from krishna but what we can focus on is making sure that we are practicing bhakti diligently nourishing our intelligence and making our heart open to higher experience and the values will automatically change hmm? Yeah, uh, so how do we make sure then also then not to use it as an excuse that well I have material desires so what I'm going to keep praying and pushing for that it will be spiritualized it'll be dovetailed and and yeah I guess my question how do yeah. we still push ourselves and find that good balance? yeah so this is where some this this how do we push ourselves well. I think one of the best ways is to associate with serious devotees. You know, to actually value spiritual things. You know, we need to see devotees who have a lot less things we have than we have, and still have a lot more happiness than what we have. And you see, we need to associate with serious devotees. You know what? As it is said, love matra sadhu sangha. That even a moment of devotees, serious devotees association helps. Why? Because in that moment. we will be in few we, we can be infused with spiritual desires mm. so that's why that association is important and beyond that ultimately we can't force anyone as i said we can only help the unable not the unwilling if somebody wants to stay at a particular level and that's where they want to be well well okay prabhupad created a platform for them in india through life membership You stay connected. You give some patronage. Come to the temples and experience the morning program. Its pathway to come higher is there, but okay, except you where you are. So we may not invest so much time and energy in that person if we are leaders of community. We may focus more on those who are interested in growing, but others they are staying at that place. That's what they want. You can accept them also, but from our perspective, uh, we can't really. Uh, if we are going to stay here, then it's going to take a long, long time for us to grow spiritually. So, in principle, we need to accept that material desires should not be my top priority. Although they may be my top priority right now, but if somebody doesn't even accept that, oh yeah, material desires will become a lesser priority later. And when is that later? As they say, tomorrow has no end. So, somebody doesn't have a finite plan. Somebody may take up a job. Which uh, which requires a twelve, fourteen, sixteen hours of work, and now if that's what they're going to do for the rest of their life, that's not healthy. But if they plan that, okay, I want I'll do this kind of job for three or five years or whatever, and then I want to retire or take a lower salary earning job, I will focus more on that. Well, if they are guided that way, then that is fine. But uh, I think uh, postponing our postponing our spiritual spiritual life because we have material desires. that is that is going to be counterproductive so we may decide that okay i may not be able to practice spiritual life at this level because right now i have all these material ambitions so maybe i'll practice at this level but i want to come from this level to this level and i have a finite i have a tangible plan for that so then it is healthier then it shows our earnestness for spiritual growth okay thank you very much grantra shrimad bhagavatam ki shila prabhu pad ki गौर भक्त बंद की गौर प्रेमानंद